Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the ADECO Q2 Results 2024 conference call and live webcast. For operator assistance, please press star and zero. The conference must not be recorded for publication or broadcast. At this time, it's my pleasure to hand over to Benita Barretta, Head of Investor Relations. Please go ahead, madam. Good morning, and thank you for joining the ADECA Group's conference call today. I'm Benita Barretta, the Group's Head of Investor Relations, and with me are the ADECA Group CEO, Denny Mashuel, and CFO, Coram Williams. Before we begin, we want to draw your attention to the disclaimer on slide two. Today's presentation will reference GAP and non-GAAP financial results and operating metrics. This conference call will include forward-looking statements. These statements are based on assumptions as of today and are therefore subject to risks and uncertainties. Let me now hand over to Denny and the results report. Thank you, Benita, and a warm welcome to all of you who've joined the call today. Let's turn to slide three, which provides an overview of the quarter. All the group delivered 5.8 billion euros in revenues, 2% lower on an organic 20 days adjusted basis. We delivered another quarter of strong share gains and clear outperformance in challenging markets. The group grew 375 basis points ahead of its key competitors on top of 775 basis points in the Q2 period last year. The gross margin of 19.4% was 70 basis points lower year on year. It is a robust result that reflects the current business mix, and firm pricing. We've delivered an above target 162 million euros of GNA savings run rate. And in Q2, GNA expenses were 19% lower than the 22 baseline, supporting the group's EBITDA of 179 million euros and 3.1% margin. Adjusted EPS, was 0.64 cents, 1% lower year-on-year -on, -year on a constant currency basis. Net debt to EBITDA ended the quarter at three times, a 0.2 times reduction compared to the prior year's period. Cash performance improved, driven by good working capital management. Cash flow from operations was plus 162 million euros better by 82 million euros year on year, and the cash conversion ratio was 84%. As part of the group's ongoing commitment to sustainable growth, we are pleased to announce that the Science-Based Targets Initiative has approved our 2030 and 2050 net zero emission targets, including detailed year on year reduction paths. It now move to slide four in our strategic progress. We've consist consistently delivered against the simplify, execute, and grow plan, which was established to drive better, faster execution and improve financial performance. So to highlight a few achievements, the group has made significant strategic investment over the last two years, gaining substantial market share and positioning itself close to leading the market in revenue terms. These investments include, for example, adding capacity to consistently capture growth opportunities in ADECO, APAC, or Southern Europe, as well as the latest technologies, such as AI-assisted coaching in ESRA. We've also protected capacity in more challenged markets where appropriate, ensuring we are well positioned to capitalize swiftly on a future recovery. By simplifying the way we work with strong execution, we have delivered 162 million euros in GNA savings, net and in run rate terms above the 150 million euros target. In gross terms, this is an absolute reduction in spending of over 200 million euros and over 20%. The organization has been right-sized, the move to shared service centers accelerated, and procurement policies tightened. Within strengthened group guardrails, we've empowered decision-making and accountability by those closest to customers at the GBU and local levels. 
we have activated a value driving tech roadmap with clear architecture, project prioritization, and balance between global and local needs. With this, we plan to simplify the group's system landscape and increase capacity for innovation and disruptive technologies, harnessing data and AI to enhance our competitive edge. Last but not least, in HR, we are driving a group-wide values and culture initiative to support a collaborative, transparent, and high-performance culture with an absolute focus on clients and candidates. Moving now to slide five and more color on the GNS Savings Program. Since announcing the 150 million euros net target in Q4 2022, the group has methodically worked to achieve it. Supported by the task force, which has worked with the GBU's countries and functions to identify actions and improve the speed of delivery. This disciplined execution has enabled us to overachieve. As of mid-2024, we've delivered 162 million euros in savings, net and in run rate terms versus the 2022 baseline. 109 million euros of savings have come from simplifying and consolidating corporate and enabling functions, including by shifting administrative tasks to offshore shared service centers for finance and HR. 53 million euros of savings have been delivered from GBU and country structures, mainly by eliminating duplication and reducing the number of organizational layers. GNA headcount has decreased by 12%, while non-personal cost cuts have driven 66 million euros of savings. For the Q2 period, GNA savings represent a 19% reduction versus the 2022 baseline, <clears throat> bringing GNA expenses to 3.4% of revenues. Looking forward, we have a clear plan to sustain GNA expenses below 3.5% of revenues per annum. Let me now hand over to Colm, who will provide details on the Q2 results. Thank you, Denis, and good morning to everyone. Let's discuss the context within each GBU, beginning with ADECO on slide six. ADECO has demonstrated resilience in challenging markets and delivered a solid performance. It took further market share with relative revenue growth of 220 basis points in the period at a market-leading profitability level. Revenues were 4.5 billion euros, 2% lower year on year on an organic trading days adjusted basis. Flexible and permanent placement revenues were both 2% lower, while outsourcing activities were up 15%. On a sector basis, growth was strong in retail and solid in logistics. However, demand was weak across the autos, manufacturing, and IT tech sectors. Gross margin was healthy with pricing firm. Gross profit per selling FTE rose 2%, while selling FTEs reduced 4%, reflecting the agility with which we manage the business. The EBITA margin at 3.4% was 10 basis points lower, reflecting lower volumes, geographic and solutions mix, substantially offset by better productivity, G&A savings, and the favorable timing of FESCO JV income. Slide 7 shows a deco at the segment level. In France, revenues were 8% lower in a challenging market. The decline was broad-based, with notable softness in manufacturing and logistics. France's EBITA margin mainly reflects negative operating leverage. Management remains focused on improving sales intensity and right-sizing to drive performance improvement. Revenues were 11% lower in Northern Europe, including 12% lower in the UK and Ireland, 13% lower in the Nordics, and 1% higher in Belux. The region performed well compared to competitors. In sector terms, autos, consulting, and manufacturing were subdued. DAX performance was robust, 
with revenues growing 1%. Germany was up 1%, reflecting a tougher market environment while strongly outperforming competitors. Logistics, IT tech, and retail were strong, while autos were slightly lower, mainly due to base effects. In Southern Europe and EE MENA, revenues grew 4%, ahead of competitors. Iberia was up 10%, EE MENA was up 7%, and Italy was flat. Logistics, food and beverage, and retail were strong. In the Americas, revenues were 5% lower. LATAM was up 13%, led by Colombia. In North America, revenues were 14% lower, reflecting continued market headwinds in flexible placement with lower demand from large enterprises. On a sector basis, retail was strong, while IT tech and autos were notably weak. The region's EBITDA margin reflects lower volumes, right-sizing efforts, and calibrated investment in the U.S. network to drive future growth. In APAC, revenue growth was strong, up 14% and firmly ahead of the market. Japan was up 11%, India up 13%, and Asia up 7%. In Australia and New Zealand, revenues were 41% higher, boosted by a significant government contract that started in Q3 23. The EBITDA margin of 6.6% includes an impact from the favorable timing of the industry's support fund at FESCO. On an underlying basis, the margin improved 10 basis points, mainly reflecting higher volumes, the current business mix, and disciplined cost management. Let's move to ACODIS and slide 8. ACODIS's revenues were 2% lower year-on-year on, year on an organic trading days adjusted basis. Staffing revenues were 17% lower, challenged by the ongoing tech staffing market downturn. Consulting revenues were solid, up 4% year-on-year. EMEA was robust, if mixed. Revenues in South EMEA were up 5%, with France up 5%, reflecting good auto activity and strength in Spain and Italy. In North EMEA, Revenues were 6% lower. The CODIS NXT, formerly Data Response, was 7% lower, reflecting weaker demand for software development expertise. Germany was 3% lower due to more challenging market conditions, particularly in autos. North America revenues were 14% lower, weighed by the continued downturn in tech staffing. Solutions revenues rose 30% organically. APAC revenues rose 9%, with Japan up 7%, led by tech staffing. Australia rose 9%, with consulting up 34% organically. The EBITDA margin at 4.9% was 30 basis points lower year on year. This result mainly reflects seasonality and market challenges in the US and Germany, partially offset by disciplined cost management. By service line, staffing margins were under pressure, while consulting margins were broadly stable year on year. Let's turn to slide 9 and LHH. Revenues in LHH were 7% lower year on year on an organic trading days adjusted basis. Recruitment solutions revenues were 13% lower, with the segment continuing to face market headwinds. Gross profits were 13% lower and U.S. gross profits were 17% lower, both modestly improving sequentially. Productivity improved, with FTEs reduced by 8% year-on-year as management exited low performers. At the same time, the team is protecting capacity and selectively hiring experienced consultants to capture a future rebound in market activity. Career transition was healthy in a strong comparison period, with revenues 10% lower and good growth in Canada and France. It continues to take share with over 2,000 new clients here to date, and its pipeline remains solid. Learning and development revenues were 1% lower organically, 
Ezra performed very strongly, with revenues growing 45% organically and a strong pipeline. General Assembly continued to pivot towards B2B, while talent development was subdued. Revenues in Pontoon were 7% higher, led by growth in direct sourcing activities. LHH's EBITA margin of 7.5% was 10 basis points lower year on year. The margin reflects lower volumes and changing mix, substantially countered by organizational optimization and good G&A savings. Let's turn to slide 10. On the left, we review the group's gross margin drivers. In Q2, on a year-on-year -year basis, and under the group's accounting policies effective January 1, 2024, currency translation and portfolio scope had a five basis point positive impact. Flexible placement had a negative impact of 20 basis points, mainly driven by the ADECO GBU's current geographic mix. Permanent placement had a 30 basis point negative impact, reflecting lower volumes, while career transition had a 10 basis point negative impact, reflecting a strong comparison period. Outsourcing, consulting, and other had a 15 basis point negative impact, mainly driven by lower volumes in Pontoon's MSP and RPO services. In total, the gross margin was 70 basis points lower on a reported basis. At 19.4%, it is a robust result, reflecting current mix and firm pricing, as we can also see in gross profit developments year on year, with the group down 5%, but ADECO only 2% lower, in line with its revenue development. On the right, we review the year-on-year -year drivers of the group's EBITA margin this quarter. At 3.1%, the EBITA margin was stable year-on-year. -year. Gross margin developments were fully offset by a five basis point positive impact from productivity improvement, a 45 basis point positive impact from G&A savings, with costs down 11% year-on-year, and 20 basis points positive impact from favorable timing of FESCO JV income. Let's turn to slide 11 <clears throat> and the group's cash flow and financing structure. As you will recall, the group's cash flow generation is seasonal, with H1 usually being a cash out and H2 usually being a cash in period. Cash performance improved, with cash conversion at 84% over the last 12 months from 73% in Q1. Q2 operating cash flow was up 82 million euros year on year at plus 162 million euros. It benefited from favorable working capital development of 116 million euros, supported by good working capital management. DSO improved by half a day year on year to 52.5 days. Free cash flow was 100 million euros higher year on year at 128 million euros, supported by lower capital expenditures. Let me touch on the financing structure. Net debt to EBITDA was three times at the end of Q2, reflecting a seasonal peak due to the dividend distribution and 0.2 times lower year on year. The group has a solid financial structure with fixed interest rates on 81% of its outstanding gross debts, no financial covenants on any of its outstanding debts, and strong liquidity resources, including an undrawn 750 million euro revolving credit facility. The group remains firmly committed to deleveraging, supported by productivity gains, G&A cost reductions, lower one-off charges, now that we've delivered the savings program, and lower capital expenditure. Let's turn to slide 12 and the group's outlook. Revenue developments in Q3 2024 are expected to be similar to those in Q2 24 on a year-on-year -year trading days adjusted basis, with market conditions likely to remain challenging. The group will focus on sustaining G&A savings whilst continuing to position capacity to capture growth opportunities and market share. 
In Q324, the group expects its gross margin to improve sequentially in line with a normal seasonal movement of 40 to 50 basis points. The group expects a modest reduction in SG&A expenses in the region of 15 to 20 million euros from the 969 million euros reported this Q224, excluding one-offs. And with that, I'll hand back to Dini. Thank you, Cora. Let's, know, let's turn to slide 13. In Q2, the group continued to progress its strategy and execute in a methodical, disciplined way. The efforts have significantly strengthened the business. We've delivered strong share gains for eight consecutive quarters. We've over-delivered on savings, achieving 162 million euros savings net in runway terms. Looking forward, we will further progress the simplify, execute, and grow agenda. We have a clear plan to sustain GNA expenses below 3.5% of revenues per annum. Moreover, we are determined to continue outperforming the sector and are managing frontline resources with agility to enable us to benefit swiftly when labor markets improve. Thank you for your attention, and let's now open the lines for Q&A. Operator, we're ready for the first question. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. You will hear a tone to confirm that you have entered a queue. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Anyone with a question may press star and one at this time. Our first question comes from Suhazini Varanasi from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Thank you for taking my questions. Um, I have two, please. When you think about the original guidance on gross margins for 2Q that you gave with the 1Q results in May, it was supposed to be broadly in line with the 1Q levels of 19.8% versus why you actually landed up, which was 40 basis points lower. Can you maybe discuss what changed versus your original expectations and the degree of confidence you have on the gross profit guidance for the next quarter? Second question, um, in July, uh, your credit um, rating on your debt uh, was changed. The outlook, I think, was changed from negative to stable, and this raised some concerns, I think, among your credit investors. So do you have any plans to accelerate the deleveraging process on the balance sheet to help allay some of those concerns there? Thank you. Good morning, Sursini. This is Coram. I'll cover both of those questions. Um, on gross margin in Q2, we did guide for broadly in line and obviously came in a little bit lower than that on 19.4%. Um, we think that is a healthy result. And probably the two things that were slightly lower than we'd expected were PERM, uh, where it was down 30 basis points and we'd guided towards 10, and flex, which was down 20 when we'd guided towards being down 10. So these are not major movements. And I think that the key point about gross margin is that it's really all about the current business mix right now. It's about the pressures that we continue to see in PERM. It's the geographic mix uh, in ADECO with the lower gross margin countries growing faster than the higher gross margin countries, but there is nothing structural happening in our gross margin. It's all about mix. Our pricing is firm. The spread between bill rate and pay rate was up again year on year in Q2. And uh, as I mentioned in my script, the ADECO gross margin was down by the same amount as the uh, revenue line, again a signifier that our pricing is firm and we're using dynamic pricing where it's appropriate to capture the value of the services that we bring. So I have good confidence that we will improve sequentially in the way that we've described for Q3. On the uh, S&P change, I mean, let's be clear. We still have a very high investment grade credit rating. It is triple B plus BAA1. The only thing that S&P moved was the outlook. And as is clear from their report, the reason that they did that was not about the execution of the business, which actually they commended. It's about the macroeconomic challenges that we continue to face. Our balance sheet is strong. 
we've got no financial covenants, no outstanding commercial paper, strong liquidity, and as I outlined in my uh, remarks, we've got a very clear plan for deleveraging, and we do that through productivity improvements, the flow through of the GNA savings, which we've delivered above target, lower one-offs now that we're largely through our GNA cost reduction, and lower capex. And there's tangible progress that you're seeing in the Q2 numbers because our operating cash flow is up over 80 million, our free cash flow is up 100 million, and our leverage has actually come down year on year in a seasonally high leverage quarter. Thank you very much. The next question comes from Andy Grobler from BNP Paribas. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, good morning uh, to from me as well, if I may. Um, firstly, just sticking with cash flow, um, DSOs improved during the quarter. To, to what extent do you think that improvement is sustainable or you know, is there further to go uh, on that metric? And then secondly, just from a demand perspective, given some of the macro uncertainties that surround us, are there any signs of, uh, of a change in behavior from your clients, either positive or negative, in, uh, in recent weeks? Thanks very much. Thanks, Andy. I'll take the first one, and Denis will pick up on the second one. We're really pleased with our DSO performance. We've had a real focus, as you know, on cash flow. You're seeing the tangible results of that in the Q2, and one of the levers that we've got is obviously around DSO and a half-day improvement in DSO for the group is worth somewhere between 35 and 40 million of cash. So this is a real focus for us, and you can see for the market and the industry as a whole, actually DSO is going the other way. Um, so I think our focus is paying off. We will continue to really home in on this to make sure that we drive further benefits in operating cash flow. We've incentivized on operating cash flow as a metric, which means that management is really homing in on it, and we believe it's sustainable. And on the demand, uh, as we said in our outlook, we, we don't see any major changes uh, in the Q3. We said that our revenue development will be more or less in line in Q2. So we expect the regions that have been performing, and there are several, uh, uh, you know, in this past quarter to continue. I think we have good traction in APAC, good traction in Latin America, good traction in uh, Southern Europe, Eastern Europe. So having, we have some, uh, some signs that uh, there are some supportive economies around. Uh, of course, there are places where, we, you know, markets are, are more challenging, uh, and we, we, you know, we adapt our capacity to that. So I think what, what we, we, are, we are very agile, in making sure that uh, we, we adjust our resources. One thing that could that interesting to, to look at is the trends in recruitment solutions uh, at HH, particularly in the US, and also the tech staffing in the US. What we've seen, I mean, these are difficult markets. As you could see, year on year, uh, we're down. But sequentially, we've seen signs of stabilization. And uh, so on these things, we believe that we are at a trough, Let's be clear, we haven't seen an inflection yet, but um, we don't think it's going to get worse. Um, and we are positioning ourselves uh, for the rebound. That's what uh, Cora mentioned in his remarks as well. We are protecting capacity. We've recruited some good people, particularly in LHH, to make sure that uh, you know, we're ready to accelerate as soon as the markets restart. Excellent. Thank you. Next question comes from Simona Sarli from Bank of America. Please go ahead. Yes, good morning and thanks for taking my questions. So, on, uh, first of all, on a gross profit margin, um, you have indicated that it will be sequentially up with the normal seasonality pattern, so the plus 40, 50 basis points quarter over quarter. Um, if you can Please explain how comfortable you are with that, especially in the context where your main competitors are actually being a little bit more conservative and indicating only like a small improvement of up to 20 basis points. Um, secondly, on uh, the reduction 
in uh, GNA of 15 to 20 million. Uh, how much of that is related to temporary readjustments in capacity and how much more it will be sustainable in studying the medium term? And lastly, on your CAPEX guidance for 2024, you are cutting that from 180 million to 150 million euros. So part of that is, of course, related to Q2, but for the balance of that, what is guiding this reduction? Thank you. Thank you, Simona. I will take all three of those questions. Um, on gross margin, as I mentioned, uh, we are confident that we will see the sequential improvement in line with seasonality. Clearly, that implies there's no major change in trends, and that's very consistent, I think, with our revenue guidance. And I can't comment, obviously, on what competitors are guiding towards, but I would say we have a slightly different mix. So we are confident in our view on gross margin, and I think it is consistent with what we're saying about the trends that we see in the market. On SGNA, the 15 to 20 million reduction, um, obviously the part of that is the flow through of the additional run rate, the over delivery on GNA savings uh, that we were, that we've seen at the end of Q2 and that will flow through in Q3 and Q4. But there's a small amount of it where we're expecting to adjust capacity. Um, to be clear, you've seen us do this all the way through the last few quarters, where there are opportunities for investment to drive growth and to take share, then we will increase our selling capacity. And where we find markets that are challenged, obviously we reduce selling capacity. We have flexibility in that part of, uh, of the cost base. But, as Denis mentioned, we also protect capacity to make sure that we can really capture rebound. You've got to be a bit careful because the base moves around. So there'll probably be a little less GNA saving in Q3 and a little bit more uh, in Q4. And then finally on, on CapEx, I mean, a big driver of this is obviously that Q1 and Q2 were lower than we had been uh, anticipating and certainly lower than this time last year. Part of that is because we had elevated CapEx levels in 2023 because of the contract that we won in Australia, the big government outsourcing contract. But it also reflects, I think, the focus that we've got on making sure um, that all aspects of our cash flow are managed effectively and that we're being disciplined in the way that we manage our CapEx spend. It doesn't mean we're slowing down the investment that we need. That's not the case. But it is about being disciplined and making sure that we are spending what is appropriate. Thank you. And can I please have just a clarification on the gross profit margin? Because clearly um, in Q2 it can be a little bit softer than expected in PERM and also in FLAX. Um, in order to deliver these 40 to 50 basis points of sequential improvement, are you therefore assuming that there are going to be an improvement in uh, uh, both in PERM and FLAX? No, there's no – so I think you've got to distinguish between the sequential improvement, which is effectively in line with seasonality, but that obviously would put us 50 or so basis points down year on year. And just to clarify where that's coming from, it's probably about 15 bips on uh, career transition, because obviously while that business is still at pretty high levels, we can't sustain given the comps that we've got in the second half uh, of last year. A little bit of um, downside, around 10 basis points on uh, OCS, so outsourcing and consulting, largely because of the mix in Pontoon and a 20 to 30 basis point year-on-year -year decline in flex because of the geographic mix in ADECO. So please, please just be careful about distinguishing what we're saying on sequential and what that means year-on-year. -year. Thank you. The next question comes from Remy Grenou from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. 
Good morning and thanks for, for taking my questions. I've got a few. Um, <clears throat> the first one is that there seems to be a clear divergence in performance between Southern Europe and Northern Europe and North America on the other side, which, which have been weaker. So if, if you could give us more flavor on what's driving that and if you have a, any discussion with clients which would yeah, give an idea of what are the underlying, underlying drivers of that, 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 that divergence. That's the first question. The second one is on uh, what's, what's your view on the outlook in the U.S. in the context of what we've seen in some of data, the labor market were loosening, and, and your comment on temp activity in that, that country being uh, subdued. So, yeah, it would be interesting to have a view on the outlook there. And then the last question relates to um, the working capital improvement. Uh, my understanding was that this uh, divergence in performance was driving, between Southern and Northern Europe, was also driving a negative working capital effect because in Southern Europe, the, the working capital might be a little bit higher uh, than in Northern Europe. So just correct me if I'm wrong on that. And if, if that's the case, uh, I, I think it would be interesting to yeah, have a bit better view on what's driving that improvement in, in DSO and if it has offset that kind of potential negative uh, mix effect in, in Europe. Denis, we'll take the first two, and I'll pick up on the working capital piece, uh, Remy. Absolutely. Thanks, Remy. So, uh, first of all, on the geographies, definitely, uh, I mean, the, the, I would say the, the major uh, factor for the difference is the, is the macros in, the, in these countries. Uh, we definitely have a, a good dynamic in, in Southern Europe. Uh, Italy uh, uh, is flat versus, uh, you know, the Northern Europe down. We have Spain, which is growing strongly. We have, uh, you know, uh, you know, other parts of the world, as I mentioned earlier, that are, that are quite solid. So, I think uh, it's it's many macros, uh, and you know, clients are, uh, you know, th there's there's no major difference in uh, in in, in the client conversations than than what we had before. They adapt to their own their own markets. So, um, North America is a is a market where. Uh, there has been, um, you know, uh, post-COVID, there was a lot of uh, uh, recruitment. Um, uh, you know, after the, the Great Resignation, there was a lot of recruitment, and companies are sort of uh, staying, uh, you know, at the level of employment that they that they that they had uh, just, uh, uh, you know, after this big effort that they made in 2022 to recruit. So at the moment, it's it's more or less. Stable. The temp market in in the U.S. is at uh, historic low. Uh, the temp penetration is is quite low, um, and uh, it's it's across the the whole uh, temp industry. Uh, so uh, yeah, we 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 hear the uh, you know increase in uh, unemployment in the uh, in the U.S. Uh, labor market. Um, it's uh, difficult to anticipate what's gonna what's gonna happen in the next uh, quarters. Of course, the political uncertainty uh, creates uh, economic uncertainty uh, that this uh, that doesn't help. What we know is uh, the plan that we have in the U.S. is delivering, and that's what matters to us. Uh, as you know, we have a turnaround plan that is on the way, and uh, it, it is delivering results. So we believe that quarter after quarter, we are, we are in a good place to capture any type of rebound, now it's it's too early to say whether uh, this uh, you know when when this is going to come. And let me pick up on the working capital point. I mean, Remy, you're right that uh, when a business is growing, it absorbs working capital, and when a business is uh, declining, then it tends to release. So you know, all other things being equal, you'd have very modest absorption of working capital in Southern Europe and a modest release of working capital in Northern Europe. And obviously, if I step back, that's true for the group as a whole. So um, our sales line is down slightly, uh, obviously a very strong competitive performance, but that does mean that there has been a modest release of working capital. But, and this is really important, that DSO management, the 0.5 day improvement, is a big driver of our operating cash flow. It's worth 35 to 40 million of the 80 or so million upside. And then on top of that, at the free cash flow level, you've got the, the CapEx benefits. So uh, I think it's really important to recognize, yes, there are working capital characteristics at play here. 
but we've done a very good job of managing that and improved DSO in challenging markets. Okay, and so if I if I can just follow up on on the the, on the environment in the U.S. and that comment around uh, temp penetration being extreme, being at a, at a low level there, is it something that you would consider as normal, given where we are in the cycle and the current environment, or is there any structural reason which explains the decline in in penetration or any other other drivers? I don't think it's structural. I don't think it's structural. It's uh, you know we are in a cyclical business again. Uh, there was some good momentum some years ago, and then you know uh, post-COVID, as I said, company have reopened the doors. There was an inflow of people, uh, and uh, now it's more. So we had a historic high. Uh, if I go back uh, two three years ago, and then uh, now we're you know companies are recalibrating. The political uncertainty doesn't help, so that's that's where that's where it explains where the industry is at the moment. Okay, understood. Thanks very much. The next question comes from Rory McKenzie from UBS. Please go ahead. Oh, good morning. It's uh, Rory here. Three questions, please. Um, firstly, on this point on the market share gains, I know you focus on the the recent year over year growth trends, but I think your organic revenue itself declined sequentially in Q2, pretty similar to peers, and is now back below the 2019 level. So it's hard for us to really see any gains this cycle overall. Are you trying to tell us that you've won more contracts or more wallet share, and that will be more visible should markets actually turn? Um, and then secondly, on capacity. Again, you, you talk about protecting capacity, but I think your organic headcount is also now back below the 2019 level, and you're suggesting small further cuts in, in Q3, whereas some peers have, have kept headcount at much higher levels. So how confident are you that you can capture a rebound overall? Um, and also, are you still confident in the usual recovery drop-through rate? I, I guess the concern would be that a, a lot of costs might need to go back in to support a recovery. And then just finally, a quick one on the FESCO JV. Um, that subsidy you received in Q2, was that all cash in this quarter? Um, and also, what's the outlook for Q3 and Q4 JV income? Thank you. Denis will take the first and the second, and then I'll pick up on Fesco JV. Okay, so um, the, the um, um, you know definitely when you look at the uh, growth rates of uh, main competitors, when you look at the uh, market uh, dynamic, we are gaining share. This is it. You know, we're we're uh, yes, our revenue is declining. It's it's obvious you've seen it. Uh, you know, minus two percent in Adeco, particularly. But our relative revenue growth is as, is plus 120 basis points. So, you know, our markets are fragmented. So even though our revenue is declining, we are taking a bigger share of uh, of the market. That this is it. You know, so uh, we are, uh, you know, we, we, for the eighth consecutive quarter, the growth pillar of our strategy, of the of our simplified liquid plan, is delivering. So we there, and you you highlight the, the two elements of us gaining market share. Yes, with clients, we increase our share of wallets because we are. Uh, you know, we are more efficient in the way we deliver our service, particularly in the temp business, you know, speed is of the essence. So our systems, you know, the digitization that we've uh, put in, in our, you know, in our business, the way we interact with our uh, associates, with our, with our candidates, uh, you know, the faster, uh, the better we are able to interact with them, the better we are able to provide the clients with the necessary people. So that's that's how we can share of wallet, particularly with the large accounts. The on-site business is getting traction. That's also a way to gain share. Uh, so, and on top of that, we have focused our teams on prospects, on reaching out to new clients, and we've won also more contracts. So those two things are definitely levers uh, that explain why we've, uh, we've gained shares. And, you know, the omni-channel that we have implemented in several countries, 
being the digital channel, the branch, uh, and the way we serve our large clients with career centers, all that uh, helps us, uh, you know, de you know uh, be better than our competitors. On the, um, so Rory, this is Coram. Let me pick up on this point uh, and add to uh, Denise's answer on the sort of protecting capacity. I think, I think it, I understand the point that you're making, but I think it's really important to recognize if I compare Q2 24 gross profit with Q2 19 gross profit, it's not down. It's actually slightly up. Um, and we are being <clears throat> very dynamic in the way that we manage capacity. So we added headcount in Q2 in Southern Europe. We added into APAC. We added into LATAM. And you can see that we're fueling the growth. And where there are pressures in the market, obviously we are reducing headcount, but we are being very cognizant of the need to protect capacity and not cut to the bone. And there was a data point that I gave you in my script, which is if you look at recruitment solutions, particularly in the US, which is down mid-teens, our headcount is down 8%. So we have been very careful to make sure that whilst we are managing to the recovery ratio, uh, we are not cutting capacity that will prevent us from being well positioned to capture the recovery. That is a very clear part of our strategy, and we manage according to the gross profit per FTE. And just on that data point, it's also up. So if I look at Q2 24, we're at 32.2. If I look at Q2 19, we're at 28.4. So there's been a productivity gain as well during that period. So understand the challenge, but we are being very careful in terms of the way that we're managing this. We're driving productivity and we're protecting capacity to make sure that we continue to gain share, particularly when the recovery comes. On FESCO, um, I want to just be uh, clear on this one. The industry support fund is something that happens every year. Uh, it is a, um, a way of incentivizing employment uh, in China. We have a very good business in China. It's growing nicely. It's got good profitability characteristics, even without uh, the industry support fund. But we never quite know when in the year that subsidy is going to come. Uh, it came in Q1 of last year, Q2 of this year. So we would not expect further subsidies in Q3 or Q4, and that means you should work on a contribution from the FESCO JV of around $5 million per quarter in Q3 and Q4. The cash has been received in FESCO, but obviously we receive a dividend from FESCO later in the year. So I hope that helps. Yes, that does. Thank you. Just to come back on that um, point you made on the um, capacity point quorum. Um, you know, obviously we're, we're struggling to deal with the aggregate metrics, and, and you have the you know, sub sub details, which maybe help more. But I guess most profit going from Q219 to Q224, you know, has seen a very large acquisition contribution and a unique inflation cycle. So I guess it, it's hard for us to pick out from that that there's any real you know, structural expansion or, or or rebound potential in the group, if you see what I mean. But maybe we could follow it up at a different time. Thank you. No problem. I, look at the data points that we're providing in terms of, because I think Recruitment Solutions is the best example of this. Um, we could have cut that capacity further. We could have driven a higher short-term margin, but we have very deliberately chosen not to leave all capacity, but to focus on performance management, to exit weaker performers, and to retain a strong sales base, which will really allow us to to grow when that market comes back, which it will. Thank you. The next question comes from Afonso Orozio from Barclays. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, good morning, guys. Thank you for taking my questions. I have just a few uh, last questions, if I may. Um, firstly, on, on growth, just wondering if how you finished the quarter, if it was probably the same uh, April, May, and June. So the exit rate in June would be interesting to know. Um, and then what you've seen so far this quarter, so July and beginning of August. Um, and then secondly, Colin, on the, uh, the pricing environment, I think you touched 
briefly um, earlier in, in, in Suhazini's question. Um, if you can expand a little bit on your um, spread in Q2, and if uh, you said it was quite strong in Q2, so I was just wondering if region by region that was probably the same, or if there's like weakness or strong uh, strong performances in, in specific countries. And then finally, on, on the exceptional charges, um, I know it's the 58 million so far this year. Um, you're still guiding for the 19 million for the full year, so just wondering if you what's left to do here in the second half on the exceptional front. Um, is it a function of the further reduction in the sales force? And if so, where are you making these adjustments? And then just lastly, if I may, on the regional growth dynamics, uh, I note here like Italy, which has been super strong for you recently, now flat growth, and also UK deteriorating a little bit as well in Q2. So if you can comment a little bit on those two countries and, and what you expect for the second half. Thank you. No problem. Uh, Afonso, I'll take the first three, and then I think Denis will uh, will comment on Italy and the UK. On, um, on sales in the quarter and uh, into July, there are, as you know, some really big trading day adjustments on a month-by-month -month basis because of the timing of Easter, because of the timing of public holidays, etc. in Q2. So it's actually really difficult to talk about the phasing of the months within the quarter. And July itself is you know, not a particularly important month because it's the lead-in to the summer vacation. So. Um, I think the key point on revenue is that we've seen some pretty consistent trends, some areas of growth, some areas of pressure, and as Denis has described, in some of those key areas such as recruitment solutions and tech staffing, we have seen stabilization and very modest sequential improvement uh, from a on a quarter by quarter basis. So it's why we are guiding towards similar revenue development uh, in Q3. On pricing, uh, I think we've demonstrated that we've been very effective on this over a number of quarters. Um, we are very focused on dynamic pricing to capture the value of scarcity where we see it. The spread between bill rate and pay rate in Q3 was up 3% for the G12 countries, which is a good result. And, and in, in terms of are there big movements within the countries, no, it's pretty consistent because this is an area of focus for us and there's real discipline uh, in terms of the way that we're managing pricing. On uh, the one-offs, absolutely, we are sticking to the 90 million of guidance for the full year. The reason we're running slightly ahead of guidance at the half year uh, is obviously that we actually took extra actions to deliver the 162 million of run rate savings versus the 150 million target. So this is one area where us being slightly above our guidance actually I think is a good sign in terms of the actions that we've taken. There's always a little bit more that we can do on GNA. It, it, it won't be of the same order of magnitude that you've seen. We, we are now largely done with our GNA savings program. So any further one-offs will be about the adjustments to capacity that we will make. But we are sticking to the 90 million of guidance for the full year. Yeah, and on the uh, on uh, Italy and, and UK, I think it's mainly uh, a market trend we've seen uh, uh, in in the UK. Some uh, some of our large clients uh, having some decline. We have lower lower volumes uh, on our uh, on-site clients in in the UK. Uh, we see perm or so, uh, you know, slowing down. So that's uh, that's. But it, it's it's more or less in line with uh, with the market in the in Italy. Uh, same thing. I think we have a we have a mixed uh, situation, but uh, there's 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 more. It's more or less a slowdown on on market. What we what's striking is the difference between Italy and Spain. Spain, uh, uh, the economy is is, is good, and uh, we have uh, excellent performance. So, uh, but it's, it's mainly uh, linked to um, I would say market conditions. 
Okay, thank you very much. The next question comes from Sylvia Barker from JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, two questions for me, please. Firstly, just to understand the point around um, reaching a trough in part of uh, in part of your own market. So you, you mentioned recruitment solutions and IT staffing. Um, I guess if we look at the numbers on PERM, um, the, the decline was better in Q2 than Q1, but on a, let's say, two-year stack basis, it was still a bit weaker. Um, so what, I guess, what end markets within that are are you seeing um, reach a trough specifically? Um, then secondly, on Germany plus one, um, can you just update us on the logistics contracts that you won and how much the contribution from larger contracts that you, you have won and are transitioning and how much is the underlying decline within Germany? Obviously, a much better performance than the end market overall. Um, and then finally, U.S. temp volumes at all-time lows. Um, it, it was a quite interesting, you know, place to be. If you if you look at your portfolio, can you just help us with some, you know, thoughts around what, um, again, what uh, markets and industries are driving that today? Thank you. So yes. So on the uh, recruitment solutions and and tech staffing, uh, definitely we we we've, we've seen. Uh, a, st a stabilization in many countries. We've seen a stabilization in the, in the U.S. We've seen stabilization in France. So I think we're we're we believe uh, that we've uh, uh, again um, probably uh, we're probably at the lower uh, end of of the cycle. Uh, now I, as I said, it's difficult to anticipate that things are going to get better soon. Uh, but um, uh, you know, we 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 mentioned in the past that uh, you know some clients were more cautious, uh, some uh, candidates were also more cautious. There were people dropping in the process in the past uh, couple of quarters because of the probably the uh, economic uncertainty that doesn't help, uh, and that has driven uh, you know the, the the decline. Now, as, as we said, we. we we see signs of uh, of stabilization. That's that's quite positive. Let me pick up on the second and third question. So, on Germany, I'm saying this with a smile, but I'm not sure I quite accept that stripping out a contract win and market share is gets you to an underlying number. Because at the end of the day, that's how we run the business. We have to win it. Uh, and we're very pleased with our performance in Germany. Um, clearly, some of that came from logistics, um, but also I think we saw a, an autos segment, which whilst it was down slightly, low to mid single digits, that's on the back of a comp in 2 in 23, where we were up 34%. Uh, and I think others... Uh, in, this, in the industry have found it much heavier going in autos. So I, I think the German business is actually doing a very good job of winning share, taking share, and you can also see there is obviously an, an improvement in the, uh, in the margin in that business, which reflects the leverage, the operating leverage and cost savings that we've driven there. I will step back, though, and say there will be some headwinds uh, in Q3 for the group as a whole because of logistics. We have some very strong comps. We did win a lot of business, not just in Germany, uh, in Q3 of last year, and you know, it'll be difficult for us to replicate those growth rates. And I think you should work on the basis that it's probably a headwind in the ADECO GBU of about a percentage point. Um, so I hope that gives you a steer. On the U.S. temp volumes, I mean, Denis touched on the market environment, uh, which is clearly impacted by macroeconomic uncertainty. I think in terms of sectors that have done well, we've seen retail, uh, which has been very positive. We've seen uh, good traction in the small and medium enterprises, as both of us mentioned in our remarks, the larger enterprises have been a bit more subdued. And then IT tech 
has been soft and autos have been weak. So it, it's a bit of a mixed picture in terms of sectors. I think the key point on the US is that we continue to drive the turnaround. So we're really focusing in difficult markets on making sure that we've got good sales intensity, that we've got really strong performance management, the right branch network, and we are positioned to capture the growth when the market comes back, which it will. And to, cap, to give you, to complement uh, with some color on what Corm said, uh, you, you know, was talking about uh, small and medium businesses. You know, we, there is an overall market which is uh, declining double digit. Our SME business is uh, only minus one year on year, minus one percent. So that shows that there are places where, particularly if you put the right energy, if you uh, revitalize the branches as, as we're doing, you can uh, you can outperform the market. Okay, thank you very much, both. The next question comes from Kian Morgan from Jefferies. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks. Morning. Um, most of mine have been asked, so I have two very quick ones for Corum, uh, if I may. Um, just first of all, um, did your receivables factor in utilisation um, remain unchanged uh, in the second quarter, which I, I seem to recall was about 120 million euros? Uh, and then secondly, um, do you have any initiatives under consideration that are likely to assist with deleverage in the second half over and above the normal working capital discipline? So being here, things maybe like um, asset disposals, um, like property or social security receivable books. Thank you, Keen. Um, no major changes in factoring in Q2. Uh, the 120 million is a uh, fully a number. It moves around a little bit, as you'd expect, in line with sales. But it was not a big driver of the working capital benefits. As I mentioned, I think the key thing here is the way that we've been managing DSO uh, and that 0.5 day improvement year on year. In terms of the initiatives to delever in H2 beyond uh, working capital, I mean, there, there's nothing that we're considering like a disposal or, you know, last year you saw some small property sales. We're not going to see anything like that, I don't think, in, in H2. But I think the key point is if you think about our four components of our plan for deleveraging, productivity, G&A cost savings, lower one-offs and lower capex, you will see more traction on a number of those in H2 than we've seen in H1. So G&A flow through increases in H2 because of the run rate. We see lower one-offs because we're now largely through the uh, G&A initiative, and we continue to get the benefits of lower capex. So it's organic, um, but we're very confident in our plan. Uh, very helpful. Good, good luck at the next 12 months, Tom. The next question comes from Gianmarco Berro from ZKB. Please go ahead. Morning, Denise and Coraman. Congrats to the strong operational um, improvements and walking the talk. Um, two questions from my side. The first one is um, on your business in France. We talked on many industries, but uh, maybe you can also give us a bit more details and also your outlook for development in France. Um, recently, you, you mentioned that uh, it might be relatively quiet now around the Olympics, but after the Olympic um, Games, we might see some uh, changes, of course, also from a political perspective. I would just wonder um, about your view here um, in, this, in this core market. And then on the other side, also um, for uh, LHH, you mentioned that um, you are ready to accelerate the business. Is that mostly um, you are mostly referring here to um, the recruitment solution business where you see some improvements, or do you also see some triggers or operational improvements, um, maybe also in uh, learning and development, um, general assembly, for example, um, that we currently overlook where, where you are working on something um, to maybe also um, uh, grow, grow your business uh, further? Thank you. Thank you. So, yes, on France, uh, so, you know, the, the, the overall market is, is down. Uh, we are uh, a little bit below the market trend, and I'm not happy about that, as you can imagine. Um, it's, you know, for 
several uh, quarters, uh, several years, I would say, larger players have been more impacted than, than, than smaller ones. Uh, we are we are really we we have a clear action plan uh, to reduce the gap uh, versus the market. Uh, we we are adjusting okay to this downside market. So we're balancing capacity. We focused our cost base uh, and our cost base as, as, as flexibility. Um, and we adjusted to, to market conditions. So our pricing, so there, there are some good things in France. Our pricing plan is showing improvements. We've reduced the volume gap versus the market in Q2 versus Q1. Um, we are a bit suffering from some of our large clients uh, that, that, that have structural uh, you know, elements uh, where they reduce uh, their, their, you know, their temp uh, workers' um, services. So uh, we are really focusing on improving uh, the delivery to our last clients to our career centers, and this is getting good traction. And we are accelerating our on-site development. We've improved our sales efficiency on the SME segment between April and June. So there are things that give us some, uh, some you know, positive perspective. However, the French market is going to be still difficult for the, uh, you know, the quarters to come. Political uncertainty obviously doesn't help macros. Uh, the Olympics on our side won't have a big impact. We were not uh, part of the big sponsors. Was, uh, we felt it was too expensive. Uh, and uh, so, um, uh, you know, we, we'll have to look at whether, uh, let's be clear, we can look at after the Olympics whether the business that's going to grow, is it, is it going to be the CT business or is it going to be the recruitment solutions business? In both cases, we are in a, in, in a, I say, in a good place to capture whatever happens. We are we are uh, really adjusting our cost to the uh, situation at the moment. That's that's a big focus on them. I want to improve our margin in France uh, in the coming quarters. We have a plan on that. We have some positive signs that this is uh, this is going to happen. On LHH, uh, yes, definitely. If I, if I you know LHH and I. Uh, the, the big thing is, is of course, the U.S. That's, that's what has the biggest impact. As I said, the stabilization is happening in recruitment solutions. That's good. Uh, no signs of positive inflection yet, but it's, it's, uh, I'd say it's a bit reassuring for the future. We have the career transition, even though it's minus 10 in the revenue, it's still at a very, very high level. The minus 10 euro, and you compare us to a very, very high level. Last year, when we had all the tech, tech restructuring plans that, uh, that we were accompanying, and, then, and you know, we, we, had, uh, we had captured almost all of them. So that's, uh, that's good. We, we are, we're still winning business, uh, and uh, particularly in France, we have more traction in, in CT. So we've, uh, we've, uh, I'm still positive in terms of the overall level of activity that City has, and as you know, that feeds our gross margin in a very nice way. Um, you know, I'm very pleased with what Ezra is doing. We're growing 45%. Uh, we have great traction, uh, and, uh, and that's will, that is going to continue. It, it really captures uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, interest from clients that want to do a cultural change. They have to do so many transformations to do. That's positive. And then on GA, yes, we see operational improvements. Uh, we are shifting GA from a B2C business into a B2B business that has better margins, more sustainability. Um, uh, and uh, so I, I believe that GA will really uh, have, uh, you know, uh, a path to uh, – uh, you know, better results in the quarters to come. Many thanks and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question comes from Konrad Tomer from ABN Amro Odo. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Um, thanks for taking my questions. The first one, uh, on the uh, North American business, can you share with us what percentage of your revenues uh, is with the Magnificent Seven, please? The second question is uh, on leverage. Uh, I think you've done a really good job in terms of uh, getting the G&A savings in, in gaining market share. The free cash flow was up significantly. 
uh, you've showed to uh, investors that you're able to control your cost base very well. However, on a structural basis, your leverage has not really come down uh, in the last few years, despite the fact that you keep telling us that you're very adamant to bring it down. I'm just wondering, with all the low-hanging fruit done and most of the G&A expenses now uh, completed, uh, do you not think it becomes more difficult to uh, bring your leverage down going forward? And then my my last question, um, I'm sure you've, you've heard the uh, stories in the market, partly fueled by comments you may have made yourself about the dividend not necessarily being sacrosanct anymore. Um, and obviously we had the, uh, the stories about uh, potential disposals, particularly ACODIS. Is there anything on this platform that you would like to share with us on your view on these sort of uh, stories, please? Thank you. So, um, Denis, we'll pick up number that your first question, and then I'll touch on your second and third questions. Right. So, with regards to uh, you know the magnificent sevens, they are they are our clients. We don't obviously we don't uh, communicate on the numbers, but uh, it's not it's not uh, it's not massive. It's not material. Uh, obviously, they are. They are our clients because we have to play with them. I mean, we are, uh, and as you, as you know, the CT uh, business has been uh, really surfing on the Magnificent Seven restructuring uh, two years ago and uh, one year ago. And uh, we um, uh, we work with our three GPUs actually, uh, but uh, there's nothing that that uh, you know it's it's uh, the percentage is not uh, is not massive. Um, and let me pick up on uh, on leverage dividend uh, and the CODIS. And Conrad, we appreciate your comments about what we've done on uh, G&A and operating cash flow and free cash flow. It's been part of a very, very disciplined operational execution. And I think you can see that we have developed a track record for gaining share, lowering costs, and driving cash, operating cash, and free cash flow. Um, leverage is actually down 0.2 times in Q2, and I think that's important because it shows that this, is, that this effort is starting to pay off, and we've been clear that we would accelerate our deleveraging in the second half of this year and into 2025. And there's a very clear reason for that, which is up until now, the G&A savings have not been at full flow. We've been significant ones in order to access them. And as you know, CapEx has been running slightly above the natural level for the business. So I think what we're seeing is very consistent with the way that we've described our path for deleveraging, and we've always said that we get through the G&A program in order for all to flow through cash, along with the discipline on our working capital management. So we are confident we can delever, our balance sheet is sound, and therefore we believe we have the financial flexibility to delever and continue to pay dividends. Denis, I think, is going to comment yes. on the market speculation yeah. on a CODIS. And, well, actually, I'm not going to comment. <laughs> As you know, we don't comment on rumors. Uh, what, uh, what I can say very clearly is uh, a CODIS is core to our strategy. Uh, you know, the future at work strategy is based on three pillars, uh, three GBUs, a DECO, a CODIS, and LHH that are complementary to each other and that uh, provide our clients with an array of services that serve every type of need that they can have on talent and technology. This is what makes us unique and that makes us super strong and that makes us win market share. We are committed to our future at work strategy and uh, Cody is core to it. That's clear. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the last question. I would now like to turn the conference back over to Denise Matthews for, uh, for any closing remarks. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you uh, to all of you who attended the call. Just uh, wanted to uh, sum up where we are. I believe, again, that we have a solid strategy, and this strategy resonates with our clients. Over the past two years, we have 
strengthen the company. And we have strengthened uh, our execution. We've, we have a proven capacity to execute on our plan, simplify, execute, and grow. We are, as you know, we are adjusting our resources to market conditions. We have a positive view on the future, and we are ready to capture every single business opportunity that uh, will be ahead of us. So, uh, you know, we will, uh, we're ready, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really positive to whatever can happen in the future. We're solid. Thank you very much for being with us today. Looking forward to our next exchange. Have a great day. Ladies and gentlemen, the conference is now over. Thank you for choosing Coroscall and thank you for participating in the conference. You may now disconnect your lines. Goodbye.